Hi, everyone. This is Kimberly Ray with Marine Conservation Network, and thank you for joining us today. We are here with Sean R. Van Summeren. He is the founder of the Pelagic Shark Research Foundation, located in the Santa Cruz County, first shark conservationist in the world. And we are going to be discussing the shark strandings that he's been coming across. Now, you all know sharks are important to the ocean ecosystem. We talk about the sharks a lot on how they keep everything in balance and why it's important to protect them. So we're gonna to talk to Sean today about that subject and about what's happening to them. So how are you doing today, Sean? How are you, uh, you staying dry and drying out? Yeah, the sun was out today, it's overcast again, but uh, yeah, far drier than it has been for these past few months. Hi there, thank you for the introduction. My name is Sean, I'm with the Pelagic Shark Research Foundation. We're based in Monterey Bay out of Santa Cruz County. Um, one of our projects is a stranding rescue and specimen collecting unit. We established this, like I say, in the, in the 1990s. It's the first of a kind effort, kind of following in the footsteps of like say Marine Mammal Center, helping with stranded marine mammals. There's this you know, kind of sidebar project we've been cultivating for many years now regarding sharks, rays, fish, even things like giant squid that we've collected. And uh, in particular, I, I think we're gonna address the you know, the recent strandings in San Francisco Bay, I tried to put that quickly in context in long-term perspective, and then kind of address, you know, some of the, both the remedies and, you know, the, the causes, the results and stuff like that. Where, where are you finding most of these strandings? Is there one particular area or is it all up and down the coast? It's kind of all up and down the coast. The hot spots are, are de definitely San Francisco Bay. Um, our area of operation is in, in central California around the Monterey Bay. There are units and efforts underway, uh, Long Beach, uh, Marine Lab, et cetera, and some others as well. UC Davis, UCSC are all, you know, helping in this effort that, uh, started quite a while ago and is now kind of coming into its own. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife is helping coordinate this thing under the Oc Hero Lab, who's just done some really smashing work, uh, in addressing uh, identification of causality and the dynamics and, uh, you know, searching out remedies, you know, what can we do to at least, you know, slow it down, make it hurt less, that kind of thing. You've got dozens, even hundreds and thousands of these sharks dying as in like 2011, 2017, you know, it's not, not uncommon, uh, but it shouldn't be seen as like, oh, that's normal, you know, because these, these sharks and rays don't normally die in these big numbers. Have you noticed that the numbers of strandings have gone up since 2017? Uh, no. In fact, you know, it, that, was, that was the big one. That's the one that got a lot of press attention. It was baywide. It was thousands of animals. It was caught on during a bait, live baseball team where a shark was seen floundering around in the mud um, up in the Bay Area. And uh, it raised uh, the concerns of a lot of local residences because it smelled really bad. You had, you know, dozens and, you know, uh, of dead, rotted animals in these canals by nice, you know, uh, neighborhoods, you know, by Oracle Pond and stuff like that. It was, it was bay wide, you know, we're talking thousands of animals. So it raised a lot of, uh, of alarm in looking into the history of these things. These events date back to the 50s. And, and probably well before that, you know, with landfill and, and restructuring what used to be tidal marine estuaries, which are reduced by 90%. There's, you right. know, 10% of our historical tidal marine estuaries have now been converted quite nicely in, 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 in many ways to inland suburban, you know, canals, waterways, duck right. ponds and lagoons, and, you know, the double of stormwater basins to prevent flooding. There are a, a lot of systems of, of tide gates and and tubes, it's kind of a circuitous way in. And time to time, especially in the springtime and seasonally when there's anticipated big rains or flash floods, they need to close those gates, reduce the water levels to accommodate the runoff, right? It's a stormwater basin. And it, you know, then they can use pump stations, et cetera, to keep those waters from you know, flooding everything. It doesn't always work. We've had a lot of flooding just this year here locally in Monterey Bay, as well as up in the Bay Area. Oakland Zoo got all beat up. You know, it was just a, a very tough winter. So it's kind of a microcosm. We're talking maybe a hundred plus animals, something ballpark around there over the last two months. What have you found has been the major cause for all these strandings? Is it because of the storms where all the um, 
pesticide and all that that's going to the water or is it just the water's changing? What do you, what do you have so far? It's a multiple part thing. And, 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 you know, we haven't got it completely, you know, uh, figured out or sorted out. It's definitely a, an artifact of, of runoff in the watershed, right? We've got this kind of juxtaposition of very nice urban suburban, you know, waterways, uh, fun to, you know, kayak and, you know, people live right on the shore and Redwood Shores and, you know, Berkeley Aquatic Park is a lot of, you know, very neat places and stuff, but they need to control that. We do have, you know, periodic bouts of rain. We just came off a big drought and so, yeah, there's going to be a lot of junk in that watershed. You know, there's often a discussion about, oh, the water was too fresh. And therefore, these saltwater creatures, you know, died because of the, you know, low salinity. And that's right. kind of a handy excuse, right? But, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of striped sea bass and, you know, anadromous fish, species that are very able to cope with both salt and fresh water, brackish water. Leopard sharks and bat rays themselves are very able to cope with low salinity better than any other shark in the Eastern Pacific are these estuarine sharks, guitar fish and stuff. They're designed to deal with, you know, hypersaline okay. and low saline, right? And then you got striped bass and, and sturgeon and stuff like that, where, you know, they don't care. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll adapt to that quite, quite nicely. However, it's not crystal geyser spring water being poured into these watersheds. It needs to be understood. This is, you know, in fact, you know, runoff. Is there anything that we can do to lessen the amount of... Yeah. Stranding for anything? In part, you know, it, it, I think it's a problem. It's problematic because I don't think there's any actual, you know, remedy to it entirely. But I think you can definitely take the sting off of it and address it directly head on with the public works people. Okay. That maintain all those tide gates and inland water canals and do such a good job in preventing flooding. They've got the personnel. I've talked to the employees, et cetera, like that. The officials, the administrators and bosses are, are really cagey and don't like it home the, the property managers don't like it. it's bad publicity but you know the personnel are there they can get the equipment what i mean is scoop net so you get the first series of reports about bat rays stuck behind a tide gate and you know redwood city whatever uh whoever it happens to be you know let public works know they'll send down four or five guys in a pickup truck scoop nets big tub of fresh you know fresher clean salt water in the back of the truck scoop that critter out of there put it in the back of the truck and usher it to the coastline and so a lot of manpower. It's manpower and willingness okay. to take responsibility because there's, you know, what happens, you know, you know, what if you get stung by a bat ray? What if, you know, if there's waters, you know, people are cagey about the water quality, right? You don't want to get a cut right. you know, and all this stuff, but at the same time, they're trying to act like it's, oh, it's fresh water. No, it's, it's not. And one what of about- the ingredients is animals getting caught. That can be early on, Corte Madera, town of Corte Madera, North Bay, it's not a hundred percent thing. They can't get to all the animals. They remove a good deal of them, and that reduces mortality. I think it slows down the the you know, infectious pathogens that generate out from these you know cadaver, you know the, the deposition accumulation of rotted carcasses you know ushers in all these nematodes and protozoa and stuff like that that you know do their thing, and uh, you can mitigate that to some degree by removing rotted dead ones and i tell the public works guys look you can respond immediately while the animal's still alive and get it out of there or you can ignore it and then you'll get different set of phone calls 10 days later complaining about the smell of the rotted carcasses and you have to go down there and get them anyway these aren't sharks that are on top of the ecosystem like the great white these are like bottom dwellers or smaller size sharks these are these are are classic estuarine slash benthic sharks you know They're, they're, you know, their population could be reduced by 50%. They're considered a species of least concern because they're still so abundant. You right. Know, they, they, I, don't, I don't feel they're endangered, but they're definitely much more limited. They don't seem to get as big as they used to back in the old days, looking right. at just old photos. And, and, you know, it's anecdotal. It wasn't very careful data taken. Uh, but their abundances and range has, you know, both shifted and declined with the reduction of tidal marine estuarine habitat right so so much of that bay area was tidal marine estuaries right you know these are the good old days long gone you know skies dark with geese and ducks and tule elk and grizzly bears were you know stomping around you know that's not real practical nowadays right uh but you know the, the point is that that place was just like british columbia with better weather 
and it was stock full of all kinds of wildlife. Not for lack of trying, there's still a lot left, but there are these complications that need to be addressed head right. on. We can't just say these sharks die naturally spawning every year. That's been an excuse rolled out. I don't, don't think people should be fooled by the you know, excuse, you know, or explanation that the water was so fresh that the sharks died of happiness or something. You know, these are saltwater animals, but this water being introduced into through the watershed into these inland canals and tide gate systems that do trap animals isn't f fresh, clean water, right? It is what it is. It's runoff. It kills a bunch of different sharks. We can get organized locally based teams to respond like, you know, Marine Mammal Center has groups that go down and help marine mammals. Right. So we need we need more manpower to go out and help with the strandings of the sharks and the rays and everything like There's that. Groups like shark stewards up in San Francisco, they you know raised an eyebrow at it lately. They kind of became a little bit more aware in 2017. They they do a lot of stuff, uh, you know, with with legislation. Do good work. They they spend a lot of time off site, right? So I think you know. It, it can be irritating to a lot of people in the Bay Area because it's so forward thinking and green. They see us, some, you know, Pelagic Shark Research Foundation is like, they're not even from here. They're up in Monterey Bay talking smack about San Francisco Bay. And I'm like, no, think, no, no, no. Do you think it's because of the image that most people have about sharks? They think when they think of a shark, automatically the public thinks of Jaws and something scary and not realizing that they're really important to the ecosystem. Do you think that's why you don't have the manpower or people aren't really getting on top no, of the situation? No, you know, we, we get by in, in a large degree. I've only got you know, five to six volunteers, you know, fewer, four, and, you know, unless I make a bunch of phone calls, you know, less than that during the winter time, when there's not a lot going on, usually we get these calls, stranding calls in the spring, and I kind of pre prepare for them. This one caught us a little bit off guard. What would you suggest to the general public if they come across, they're just out walking along the beach or around the wet estuaries or whatever. What would you suggest if somebody in the general public came across one of these strandings? Who do they contact or what should they do? Do they not touch it? Do they call somebody? What is the best advice you could give if somebody comes across one? Um, nearest point of contact. So if you're at a state park, state park rangers, you know, whether it's their kiosk or ranger station, lifeguards. Uh, a lot of the rangers double as lifeguards. Contact one of those people. Let them know right away. Uh, maybe if you got the time and, and you know, follow up to a, what's the nearest marine lab? You okay. know, if you don't have like a team established, then you may contact someone there at the lab who, as a biologist, is interested. You know, people do like sharks. I don't think the shark's negative image is really an, an issue anymore. Really, you think they've gotten past that with all the ocean conservation coming up? Yeah, you know, if anything, the Jaws stereotype has become sort of a you know a tourist attraction, right? People pay money to go out and see the scary right. shark. Right. Those spend so much staying out of the water, uh, or, or like oh sharks, you know, or, or you know, and this is California too, right? So we've got like Very maybe half the sea they have it in Florida. You know, yeah. few bars bite people if ever. You know, we've got white sharks. It's pretty much the only really, you know, potentially hazardous shark there is. I used to hear that you would die sooner from a toaster in the water than you do a shark. Definitely keep your toasters out of the bathtub <laughs> or, or something like that. Just drive into the beach, right? It's much more right. risky. You right. come back and your exactly. car's all vandalized. Well, um, we're going to put down the link down the bottom on to your website. Um, any other way that people can contact you um, personally if they want to help out or if they want to um let you know our email down. address is, is psrf at pelagic.org um feel free to share our phone number if you're in california again contact the nose the nearest lab uh you know cal academy you know uh if you're in southern california uh long beach marine lab are there, is, are yeah. there plenty of labs along california because i, I mean that's kind of hard I mean, to keep track of all of them bodega bay there's bodega bay there's you know uh uc davis you know which is in part you know bodega bay as well san francisco state has helped out you know doing a lot of these you know necropsies mark ushers in a bunch of students uh who become phds and, and you know really it opens up a whole new field you know where you know a lot of people were, are queued up to go into marine mammalogy it's like hey you know right over here you know there's some interesting stuff here to do with everything you know sea turtles and you know there's you know sharks and rays and there's a lot of a lot of cool things besides just marine mammal right uh, 
or seabirds or turtles, were, you know, they're, they're adorable. Sharks, momos, less charismatic. Sharks have a lot of baggage, increasingly less. So it's kind of morphed, you know, I, I think now the sharks, it's like jaws. Oh, good. Get your fishing rod. You know, if yeah. I'm like, oh, a shark, you know, let's go out and, I, you know, dangle. dangle well, I've it. seen a change in the past couple of years, too. And when, when I used to People work over really the scared so much of the shark so much is, is you know, they want to get some, you know. That's, right, exactly. So that's a big part of it. Poaching's been a big problem. Uh, you know, there's good news. You know, the, you know, the white shark protection, protected status and regulations have been up, upgraded this year in terms of trying to address chronic poaching. People going out and catching white sharks on purpose and pretending to be doing it by accident when, you know, called into right. the carpet. Uh, right. Didn't have a lot of, you know, confidence you know, in writing a ticket. It's annoying to the prosecutors and any of the people above them to have to deal with what may be a petty, you know, you know, uh, type of thing. And, you know, there's just not, there's a lot of, you know, gray area around because some of these guys may, ah, it was an accident. You know, they right. try to catch a striper, you know, but there's a lot of guys that post on Facebook, on, on social media, you know, oh, we accidentally caught four white sharks in one night. And they'll show these pictures. They're wow. using is for bait in these big wow. steel steel i was fishing for you know a you know a leopard shark and he's got a big old you know odd six hook with wire cable leader that guy's not fishing for anything but you know white sharks right. as they show you know they catch them repeatedly throughout the season and it's it's been a problem they wash up dead from the hook injuries there's this you know favored uh you know you know pat answers like oh i i, I do nothing but catch and release you know, everything I released is, is unharmed. Is the great white shark the only shark that's actually protected? Or are there other sharks that you're not supposed to fish for that are protected? Or is it just the great white? It's pretty much just the great white shark. We need, we need the, uh, you know, I call them white sharks, right? They are great. But, you know, there's the, the great basking shark, for example. Oh, which yeah. is the most endangered species of large shark in the entire Pacific. Right. Eastern Pacific. Um, and... Canada's listed them as both endangered and a protected species in the eastern Pacific coast of Canada. You know, hits you know the the U.S. border in Washington and it goes away, and there's no real explanation about it. Uh, they just assume not. You know, they plug their ears and hum. You know, the science is good because you know they're data deficient species. So when you can't get a transmitter on one and get a science paper published, that's you know, that's the, right, that's the right. whole name of the game, Publisher Paris, right? But in terms of the conservation end, they're super, like, they don't hear that. Or, or you know, right. they're just so cautious about being cautious, which I don't understand. It's like, you know, okay. A little too much so, exactly. Not endangered. Make them protected. No one's ostensibly fishing for them now anyway, so they say. I think, they're, you know, ample evidence are being taken opportunistically for their liver, et cetera. Right. Um, but yeah, that's a whole other episode we could we could delve into. You know, the U.S. is great. Why do you think only the white world. shark is protected? Why why aren't we protecting other sharks? Why is it just the white? It's not easy you know, getting species of sharks protected. You know, uh, it just isn't because you know they're fun to catch, and 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 right. ma males especially really adore that connection with that predator right and it goes back to the image of what's associated yeah. what happens to the sharks that you find that are stranded especially the ones that are deceased what do you end up doing with the with the body do you end up sending it over to a lab and letting them do what they need to do with it, it or fresh it has to be like sushi grade you know for the optimal you know uh, so you can do histology and pathology and everything right, right? So that's the idea. When you get one of those, it's always good to send to the lab. Okay. You always do a cursory inspection because you can have a very well rotted, you know, carcass where you can barely tell what species it is. But if it has a hook in its mouth, you know, or a fishing line coming out of its, you know, gullet where it has, you know, that's kind of obvious. Okay, this is a fishing mortality, you know, or if, it, you know, sometimes fresh ones will wash it with scuff marks on them or it got tangled in a net or tangled in something, right? Okay. Um, you know, whales aren't the only things that get trapped, you know, tangled up in ropes. Right, exactly. Rescued, exactly. There's uh, multiple three. animals that get caught in those nets. Yeah, we, we've <laughs> rescued three different white sharks that were entangled in ropes here in Monterey Bay. Wow. Past five years. Wow. And uh, we had three others washed up dead. 
One had a, a pathogen infection. It's yet to be fully identified. It's being worked on. It's, some of the stuff takes a long time. Uh, one was apparently hit by a boat. We don't can't guess whether it was impaired and got hit by a boat or some of these boats just go really fast. Wow. Didn't get out of the way. I don't know. I doubt someone would steer into it and try to hit the shark, right? I don't know. Um, but if you're going real fast and the visibility is low, or you're not, you know, looking right in front of your boat, the shark can be cryptic and they'll cruise right, right in your path and you'll hit them. And so, you know, that one got hit by a, a boat, washed ashore, you know, dead. That's written off as a, you know, vessel strike. A third one washed up, but had been shot in the head numerous times. Uh, sadly, by a commercial fishing boat that was, you know, fishing very close to shore, yeah. uh, was, you know, very close to getting it caught in his net, right? He had a big net of, of pompano uh, and not a big fishing boat, but he should have known better. He's fishing very near shore at night and he shot a rifle at it, you know, a couple warning shots at its head, killed the shark, washed ashore the next morning. Wow. And uh, it was collected immediately, brought to the lab and Mark doing very meticulous CSI you know, forensic stuff was able to identify the actual rifle the bullets came from, fishing wildlife right. you know, uh, agents and investigators, you know, tracked that down and got the guy uh, to confess, you know, again, this isn't a big scale commercial fisherman, right. uh, smart boat, hardworking, you know, not a bad guy, but, you know, just again, should have known better, you know. You would mentioned before that, um, Part of what's going on is the runoffs that are coming out from the estuaries. Are there pesticides or DDT or anything like that that you think is also affecting the strandings, or is it mainly just the yeah? Water well, it, it, salt it's, water? You know, it, it, these are bioaccumulative toxins that build up. You know, as early as 2011, following the the the, the first year that Mark and Fish and Wildlife officially began the investigate, joined the investigation that I had already established. Uh, all that stuff was was looked at. One of the results following that year, that year's stranding events was that through all the investigations and data gathering, it was the, the public was, was advised not to eat leopard sharks or bat rays. The public health and safety people were obligated to report the findings because the sharks are so loaded with mercury right. and uh, pollutants, trace organochlorines and all this stuff that's bioaccumulated. These sharks can live 40 years plus they will accumulate a lot of that stuff. They're in that silty, you know, mud, muddy sediment uh, environment, eating innkeeper worms and stuff, foraging through that mud. Uh, there's still DDT in the sediments in certain areas of the San Francisco Bay. There's actually radioactive waste in San Francisco Bay from, you know, Point Hunter used to be a naval facility and stuff. I mean, it's a big city. You know, it's not the worst in the world. It's probably some of the, the the nicest in so many ways but it's not perfect right nothing is right. and we do have this chronic problem of sharks and rays and fish getting stuck in these inland waterways dying and then being discharged out into the bay what is the, strange, so, what is the strangest what is the strangest shark that you've come across that's been beached or the strangest ray that you've the rarest, I should say, maybe not the strangest, the rarest. You know, just, you know the white sharks were, 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 were unusual, I guess. They're all kind of neat in a different morbid way. <laughs> um, you know, like a 14 and a half foot sleeper shark. You know, okay. usually in the deep water. You know, they get as big as, you know, bigger, maybe even bigger than a white shark. They're deep sea. Would, what, what about a prickly shark? Isn't that a deep water shark? Yeah, we just had a 10 footer wash up. Um, I got a call from the Marine Mammal Center again and put everyone on the alert. And we were able to, I talked to Mark and we decided to call Colleen at, at uh, California Fish and Wildlife Department lab in Santa Cruz at uh, Long Marine Lab. And they were able to get a truck and run down there and get that specimen. Good. Which is we also got a uh, helpful call from a Marine Mammal, a Marine Mammal person, a uh, uh, benthic ecology student undergrad at Moss Lane Marine Lab who took pictures and helped identify it uh and uh and so yeah there there was there was loot there for everybody there you know it, that stuff like you know it's it's treasure if you're a biologist right so you had this right. you know prickly shark uh you know 10 feet long approximately uh intact very fresh you know perfect lab specimen the, you know the sad part is is you know we've been doing this for over 30 years and very few of the rescued sharks that wash up on the coast 
live once they hit the beach. They're really immune to infections, circulatory diseases, you know, cancers, right up until they're not, right? right. And so all these coastal sharks, it's, it's a different set of pathogens than what we find with the leopard sharks and the, and the bat rays in San Francisco Bay. You know, that's a protozoa primarily, and also nematodes and stuff like that. The, the, the coastal strandings of pelagic sharks, like mako sharks and thresher sharks, uh, blue sharks are a different set of pathogens. We have carnal bacteriums, which appear to be spiking in terms of strandings of, of pelagic sharks. For some decades, we've had an increased number, steadily rising number of salmon shark stranding. Okay. You know, and then in more recent years, mako sharks and thresher sharks. So oh. you have that, and then you have poachers, which will catch sharks for fun. They don't want to keep it. They don't mean to, they don't think they're doing any harm. They're not trying to hurt it. Right. They want to have it for a minute, catch it, talk about it, and then let it go. And then they don't care what happens after that. They just say it's it's all fine. But man, you know, we, we pick up a lot of animals as well that die as a result of so-called harmless, you know, catch and release. You know, I always advise the guys that are doing catch and release or concerned about catching something accidentally, use a barbell yeah. stuff. You know, it does, it's so much easier to get out, uh, especially with throat hooks or something like that. Right. The barbell's right. the problem, really. I mean, obviously the hook's a problem. Use a circle hook, barbell circle hook. So that only, so it only injures the jaw structure right. and it's not right. hard to get, the shark might shake it out himself without a barb and guys don't like it sometimes because it's, it's, it makes it harder to fish, right? Well, you know, salmon fishing requires you have a barbless hook because so many of the fish have to be released. You want to leave, release it with the best chance of, you know, a, a barbed hook is, is the rest, you know, that animal is very unlikely to, less likely, more or less likely to, to recover. So remove the barb and use proper fishing tech, you know, technique and tactics. Keep your rod tip up, keep your lines tight, and a barbell right. hook shouldn't be a problem. So to, so to conclude the interview, you, is it your point of view that all these strandings that you've been coming across is not necessarily climate change as much as it is, as it is irresponsibility of taking care of the water, the runoffs or um, catching them incorrectly or correctly. It's more of the human factor as opposed to the climate change? Well, yeah, you know, if you run that that gamut, you know, that that gauntlet of various causes, yeah, it's it's definitely, you know, you can't blame, you know, a hook injury on on global warming. Right, right. The animal caught behind the tide gate, you can't necessarily blame on global warming. It may be an artifact of, you know, the heavy rain, which preceded the use of the tidal gate. Okay. You know, I, you know so I, I don't know, and I can't say with any real, you know, I don't know. So I have to say, I don't know whether this, you know, whole thing is because of climate change. I, I Obviously climate and weather is a big factor, heavy rains or drought, right. we've had many years of drought as well. Um, you know, I, I can't say that. All I can identify is that, you know, these animals get caught behind tide gates, they die, they get washed out into the bay and then continue to die. And it's not just because the water's so fresh. And I think it could be remedied by organizing, you know, nearby teams. Okay. You know, preferably the public works guys themselves, because I think they know the waterways better than anybody. They know. Well, we'll, definitely, we'll definitely put a link to your website and your phone number if you want to put that out there. And they can yeah. uh, people can, can contact us at our website, marineconservationnet.org. We'll connect everybody together because we definitely need you the general public to help out with this because it doesn't matter if it's climate change or if it's irresponsibility of humans it's still our responsibility to take care of the ecosystem which is our life support so i want to thank you sean for being on today i've had a great time we got a lot of good information we're going to have sean back on again with more specific on specific species of sharks and you guys can comment and send us any questions that you may have this is Kimberly with Marine Conservation Network. And remember, together we make oceans a difference. Talk to you later and thanks a lot. Thanks, Sean.